Well, big news. A federal court has unsealed the search warrant and receipt from the FBI raid on former President Donald Trump's Palm Beach home earlier this week. And according to the receipt, the FBI seized miscellaneous confidential documents and miscellaneous secret documents. We also know that the FBI removed 11 sets of classified documents from Trump's home, including some marked as top secret and meant only to be availed by special government facilities. Well, joining us now with more is Chief White House Correspondent James Rosen. James, good to see you. Welcome to the show. What is the latest? What is the response that you're hearing? Lindsay, good afternoon. Of course, uh, the dust is still settling from the release of these documents late this afternoon by the Southern District uh, in, New in uh, Florida, uh, where the raid went down in the first place. Uh, the government, as we know, moved to unseal these documents yesterday. The uh, former President Trump uh, agreed to allow them to be unsealed, and they finally came out less than an hour ago. Uh, what strikes us first is that the signature of the judge on the warrant uh, judge Bruce Reinhardt, the federal magistrate judge in the Southern District, he signed the warrant on August 5th, shortly after noon Eastern time. He gave the FBI two weeks until August 19 to execute the search warrant. They waited approximately four days before they did so. That's of some interest. Uh, then we come to some of the preliminary documents in which uh, the FBI gave the judge some idea of what they were looking for, some idea of where they would go on Mar-a-Lago property and where they would not go. Uh, so to the latter, they said that they would go to offices where F. POTUS was known to work or store documents. F. POTUS, of course, standing for former president of the United States. They promised not to go anywhere that would be extraneous, such as uh, guest suites for those who were staying at Mar-a-Lago as guests. Uh, they said that they, of course, were looking for classified documents. One interesting note here was that the FBI told the judge they were also looking for any presidential documents created after January 20, 2021. In other words, after President Biden had been sworn in. It's not immediately clear how former President Trump would have gotten his hands on such documents, but the FBI attested to this judge that they were interested in seeing if there were any on the property at Mar-a-Lago. Now to that inventory receipt. Uh, this is the most interesting part uh, so far of the documents we've seen released. Uh, there were 45 separate item lines where the uh, FBI indicated uh, what they took. Some of these 45 item lines uh, consisted only of a few documents. Uh, some of these item lines refer to whole boxes of documents, so it's difficult at first glance here, Lindsay, to get a sense for just how many total pages were confiscated at Mar-a-Lago on Monday. Uh, but nonetheless, what's interesting about the various item lines, what stands out is as follows. Uh, they refer to, as you mentioned, confidential documents, secret documents, whole boxes of, the, of those. But they also referenced, and the FBI was very pointed in stating this in the inventory list, that they had confiscated documents labeled top secret. Documents labeled classified, documents labeled SCI, which stands for sensitive compartmented information. All three of those labels are different levels of classification. There's classified, there's top secret, and there's SCI. And they listed a number of boxes as containing documents with those markings. Uh, one last point of interest is that you can also see the signature on the inventory list of Christina Bob, former President Trump's attorney. There had been some back and forth uh, since Monday when the raid was first disclosed as to whether or not uh, former President Trump's attorneys received, uh, were given a copy uh, of this inventory list. Attorney General Garland in his remarks yesterday asserted that they had been. Uh, now we know for sure they were because we have the signature of the Garland in his remarks yesterday asserted that they had been. Uh, now we know for sure they were because we have the signature of the former president's lawyer on them. Lindsay. All right, James Rosen from the White House. Thank you. Well, for more on this, let's welcome in our expert panel, Harvard Law School Professor Emeritus and Newsmax analyst and the author of The Price of Principle, Alan Dershowitz. And we have former National Security Council Chief of Staff, former CIA analyst and Newsmax contributor, Fred Fleets. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Professor, I'm going to start with you. Okay, everyone was wanting this warrant. The warrant shows that Trump is under investigation for potential obstruction of justice and violation of the Espionage Act. Legally... What does that mean for Trump, and does that change anything here? No, I think that we always suspected that they would use these very broad statutes. Look, I'm old enough to remember when these statutes were used against Vietnam protesters, against Daniel Ellsberg, 
and civil libertarians and the ACLU were up in arms, jumping up and down for how terrible it is that these broad statutes have been used against the political dissenters. Now, these same people are jumping up and down saying, oh, my God, thank you for using these terrible unconstitutional statutes. As long as you can get Trump, that's good enough for me. Look, there's nothing surprising in the search warrant itself or in the inventory. What might present some surprises, obviously, is the affidavit signed by FBI agents. They'll probably redact the names of the informer, whoever it might be, or informers, but it will provide much more information. But this all supports the conclusion that this should not have been a search. There should have been a subpoena. The government knew about all this. The government was negotiating for months. They issued a subpoena. They could have gone to court any day to enforce the subpoena. Instead, they went by way of a search warrant which undercuts the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. The goal here is to get an indictment of any kind against Trump so that Democrats will then say that he is disqualified from running, which would be unconstitutional. As a liberal Democrat, I want to have the right to vote against him in the next election as I voted twice against him in previous elections. I don't want a bureaucrat telling me who's going to run for president. Mm. Fred, I want to get to the affidavit in a minute, but the receipt shows that there were documents that were highly classified and part of a highly classified program run by the United States. It's even higher than top secret. So if this is the case here and he had these documents, Trump is saying, hey, I declassified all this stuff. If he did, wouldn't there be a paper trail to all this? Um, shouldn't he, Trump, bring that forward? Well, there's a lot that we don't know here. Now, you've probably heard Democrats saying on TV today that although the president has ultimate declassification authority, there's a process he has to use. That's not true. He could simply wave his hand, write it on the back of an envelope. It is at his discretion on what's going to be declassified. But there's other things we don't know here. We know that the Trump team was negotiating with the FBI. They wanted an extra lock in the room where this material is being kept. There was no danger of this material being leaked to anyone. And I, I agree with Alan that this could have been done with a subpoena. There was no reason to take the extraordinary step of searching a former president just a, a couple of months before an election. Okay, so, Professor, you brought up the affidavit. Many people are saying, you know, this wasn't a part of it. Everyone's saying, we need to see the affidavit. What will that tell us that we want to know? Why is that so important in this scenario? Well, the only important part of a search warrant really is the affidavit. It's the input by the investigating officers uh, stating what basis they have to show probable cause for searching, probable cause for believing that perhaps a violation of these overbroad statutes may have occurred. Um, usually these uh, affidavits are not released until much later in the process. Uh, and when they are, they're usually redacted. But they're not redacted as to the material. They're redacted usually as to sources and, and methods. So I think we can expect a lot to be forthcoming. And I'm glad that both sides have now agreed to um, disclose the affidavit because the American public has the right to guard our guardians. We have the right to see whether or not the people involved in the process, FBI agents, Attorney General of the United States, magistrate judge, all complied with the Fourth Amendment and with the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. One of the reasons they went for a search is because Trump, of course, did invoke the Fifth Amendment in New York, and he could have invoked the Fifth Amendment as to whether he was obliged to produce himself certain documents. Of course, the government could have given him what's called production immunity, but they didn't want to go through that. And instead, they went through the blunderbuss method of uh, search, and yet, Garland the other day said uh, that he believed that the standard practice in the Justice Department is whenever possible to use less intrusive methods. I would love to see him answer questions as to why this is less intrusive, why these same statutes weren't used by the Justice Department against Hillary Clinton and Sandy Berger, whether his statement that the law must be applied evenly and equally is being followed in this very controversial case. And Fred, let me talk to you about the timeline here. Some people are pointing out, as our own James Rosen did, that the judge magistrate had approved this on August 5th, gave them until later in the month, but they did it on the 8th. Uh, does that raise uh, any flags for you? It does. I mean, I don't know what the urgency was here. I don't, I don't know why this was done, except it seems like it was time to make sure that Donald Trump was busy. 
and that he was not in town. But I want to raise another issue. I was with the CIA for 19 years. I worked for the National Security Council, and I think Alan will agree to this. We have a real problem in this government with overclassification. The fact that a oh, document yeah. is stamped secret or top secret doesn't mean it is. Uh, and, and it's a real problem. And I'm sort of wondering whether these are phone logs or whether maybe these are letters that Donald Trump exchanged with Kim Jong-un. We don't know what this stuff is, but let's not run to the conclusion that these are the nuclear codes. I don't think that's the case. Of course not. Yeah, because of there are reports out that these are the potentially nuclear related. I don't Even think if they that's are true. nuclear I think related, right is back that back concerning? Post the Washington Post. But even right. if they are, we'll have- they were safe. They were not anywhere that were vulnerable. And remember, it used to be my friends, the civil libertarians on the left, that complained about overclassification. Now they're the ones jumping up and down saying, it was classified. Oh, my God, it must mean that it contained the nuclear codes or et cetera. It's just nonsense. Let's wait and see. I remember the Pentagon Papers case where the uh, Solicitor General of the United States, my former dean, basically argued the country would be destroyed if these materials in the Pentagon Papers were revealed. They were revealed and nothing happened. Overclassification is often designed to protect the reputations of the people who made mistakes and want to cover their screw-ups up by classification. An interesting point. I'm out of time, but what is it going to take to get the affidavit out? What is the next process there? It'll be out. It'll be out. It'll be out. Both sides have agreed, so it'll be out. Okay. All right, so we should be waiting for that shortly. But Professor it'll be Dershowitz, redacted. Fred, thanks for we'll being get the here. the whole thing, but we'll get parts of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that will show us more. We'll be covering that. Gentlemen, thanks for being here with us. J.P. Morgan CEO is warning that an economic hurricane is coming. Are you preparing? If you don't do anything, your 401k could be a 201k, and that is not good. So call our trusted friends at Lear Capital. For 25 years, Lear has helped investors own gold to protect against market chaos. It's a good thing. They can help you, too. Get your information and up to $15,000 in bonus IRA gold. Just call this number, 800 880 that's 800-880-4300.